Shabbat Shalom, everyone. We're gathered together on the 18th of the 10th month, which happens to line up with the 31st of December on the Gregorian calendar. And for anyone that's following along or paying attention to it, Hanukkah, the real Hanukkah, will be next week on the Shabbat starting then. But that's not for now. We're currently reading the book of Hanok, and last week we went through chapters 1 through 16 of a version on a PDF from Yahweh's sword, which happened to be changed from what it originally was, so I was rather disappointed with that. We went ahead and got a different translation, typed it up, and we're going to be covering at least through chapter 13 today. So without further ado, we'll go ahead and just start reading. This is the book of Hanok, chapter 1. It says, The words of the Baraka of Hanok, with which he baruch the elect and the righteous, who would be present on the day of tribulation, when all the wicked and unrighteous are to be removed. And he took up his parable and said, Hanok, a righteous man, whose eyes were opened by Elohim, saw the vision of the Kadosh One in the Shamayim, which the messengers showed me, and from them I heard all matters, and from them I comprehended as I saw. But not for this generation, but for the distant one which is to come. Concerning the elect, I said, and took up my parable concerning them. The Kadosh Great One will come forth from his dwelling, and the eternal Elohim will tread upon the land, on Mount Sinai, and appear from his camp, and appear in the strength of his might from the Shemaim of Shemaim. And this is the part where I was mentioning the fourfold times that he came. It says that he will come forth from his dwelling, right? Now the father has always dwelt in his son because his son always does what is pleasing in his sight. And he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He appeared on the land in the Garden of Eden, where our Mashiach was walking as the voice of Elohim in the midst of the garden. He appeared on Mount Sinai when he gave the commandments to the children. He appeared from his camp after in the pillar of cloud and fire and as the messenger of the presence there that had dwelt with them. I believe you can also see it in, <clears throat> what is it, Judges or Shephotim chapter 2, where they he's rebuking them for not removing the Canaanim from the land and he gives his verdict concerning them where they start crying and they call the place Bokim because of it and then he shall appear in the strength of his might from the Shemaim of Shemaim now he also appeared physically in the camp when he was born amongst men from his mother Miriam right and then he will return in the strength of his might from the Shamayim of Shamayim, like the messenger said, why do you stare up into the Shamayim? In the same way that you saw him go, he's going to return. But he's going to be coming with his messengers. And, and it says, And all shall be smitten with fear, and the watchers shall quake, and great fear and trembling shall seize them unto the ends of the land. And the high mountains shall be shaken, and hills shall be made low, and shall melt like wax before the flame. And land shall be complete, or, and the land shall be completely torn in pieces. And all that is upon the land shall perish, and there shall be a judgment upon all. Yet with the righteous he will make shalom, and will protect the elect. And compassion shall be upon them. They shall all belong to Yahuwah, 
and they shall be prospered, and they shall all be Baruch. And the light shall be shown unto them, and he shall make shalom with them. And see, he comes with ten thousands of his Kodeshim to execute judgment upon all, and to destroy all the wicked, and convict all flesh. of all the works of their wickedness which they have committed wickedly, and of all the harsh words which wicked sinners have spoken against him. And that right there was quoted verbatim by Yahuda in his epistle. <clears throat> Chapter 2. It says, observe all matters that take place in the Shamayim, how they do not change their orbits or circuits, and the lights which are in the Shamayim, how they all come and put in order each in its season, and do not transgress against their appointed order. Again, this is a refutation for anyone that thinks that the, the luminaries are wayward now and they don't do his will. If anyone wants to know for certain how these things are functioning and how they're supposed to be perceived, I highly encourage you to study and test the Antichrist for Dummies videos series where they go through again and again. They, they talk about the history of it. They show how it was known and how it was actually something that original believers used to do. It's what the Vatican hijacked and why they have uh, telescopes and observatories all over looking at the stars not because there's space in this fictitious millions of light years and all these things going around but because they're watching the luminaries to find out what's going on that and they're literally involved with witchcraft which is astrology their whole calendar is based off of it but that's for another time However, the point here is that the stars and everything above does his will, which is exactly what our Mashiach said when he said, Our Father who is in the Shamayim, let your name be set apart. Let your kingdom come. Let your desire be done on the land as it is in the Shamayim. Right? But it says, See the land. And give heed to that which takes place upon it from first to last. How steadfast they are. How none of that on land changes. But all the works of Elohim appear to you. See the summer and the winter. How the whole land is filled with water and clouds and dew. And rain lie upon it. And these things are also expounded on later on in this book, as well as Shalomo in Kohelet or Ecclesiastes talks about the water courses and the sun. So there's different places where you can see these things being played out. I highly encourage you guys to take the time to look at that. There is also, I believe we mentioned it before, but there's a scroll in the Dead Sea Scrolls called the Divination Scroll. And it has a list of the moon and all the different zodiac signs or the constellations that it inhabits what they call the mansions of the moon it goes through the cycle of those and it also talks about if you hear lightning in a certain place or in a certain constellation or whatever then this foretells that event or if you hear this thing going on or if there's an earthquake there then it's telling a different event and it's a type and shadow of the things that you can find in revelation in a smaller scale because there's nothing that hasn't been done before. There's nothing new under the sun. And he he does things in a microcosm for those in the land, and then a macrocosm or a larger scale for the world afterwards. Chapter 3. It says, Observe and see how all the trees seem as though they had withered and shed all their leaves, except fourteen trees who do not lose their foliage, but retain the old foliage from two to three years till the new comes. And again, observe the days of the summer, 
how the sun is above the land over against it, and you seek shade and shelter because of the heat of the sun. And the land also burns with growing heat, so that you cannot tread on the land or on the rock because of the heat. Observe how the trees cover themselves with green leaves and bear fruit. Therefore give heed and know with regard to all his works, and recognize how he that lives forever has made them so. Literally, he's saying, look at the truth of how things actually are and realize his works and what he does in regard to things. And this is why I was trying to tell you he speaks in parables. There's nothing that he says that isn't in parables. And you can see what does he say about trees? What does he say about the stars? What does he say about the waters? How do they actually react or behave? It's all to teach man knowledge. Right. So the more you look at these things, the more it's going to make sense that he is all powerful and he's made everything in hokma or wisdom. Right. A perfect example. The dietary laws, you can read about them in Leviticus and in Deuteronomy or Devarim. And then the explanation for how they're supposed to be comprehended can be found in the letter of Aristes, which is about the making of the Septuagint, the epistle of Barnabas. And there's some allusions to it, and it speaks about it somewhat in the recognitions of Clement. But the other two go into more detail. And you can see how the unclean animals and the ones that you're supposed to completely abominate or just go unclean until evening and all the parables and things involved in that, it regards how those creatures behave, the type of characteristics they have that we're not to emulate. So it's something to think about. And you can do that with everything. Like I said, the waters, the light, the, the trees, how the fruits grow and develop, the ways that the fruits are promulgated, how the seed is spread, right? There's a lot of different things to keep in mind there. Verse 2, it says, And all his works go on from year to year forever, and all the tasks which they accomplish for him, and their tasks do not change, but according to how Elohim has ordained, so it is done. And see how the seas and the rivers in the same way accomplish and do not change their tasks from his commandments. Yet you, you have not been steadfast, nor done the commandments of Yahuwah. But you have turned away and spoken proud and harsh words with your impure mouths against his greatness. O you hard-hearted, you shall find no shalom. Therefore you shall loathe your days, and the years of your life shall perish, and the years of your destruction shall be multiplied in eternal loathing, and you shall find no compassion. Compassion is given to the ones who show it. Mercy to the merciful, forgiveness to those who are loving and forgive others. Right? Something to keep in mind. Everyone's going to get according to what they deserve. And it's all based on how we actually behave or what we choose to do. In those days, you shall make your names an eternal loathing unto all the righteous. And by you... All who curse shall curse, and all the righteous shall rejoice, and there shall be forgiveness of sins and every compassion and shalom and patience. There shall be deliverance unto them, a pleasant light. And for all of you sinners there shall be no deliverance, but on you all a curse shall abide. But for the elect there shall be light and joy and shalom, and they shall inherit the land. And then there shall be given chokmah, or wisdom, to the elect, and they shall all live and never sin again, either through wickedness or through pride, that might be inequity, which is willing or intentional evil. But they who are chakam or wise shall be humble, 
and they shall not transgress again, nor shall they sin all the days of their lives, nor die through plague or wrath, but they shall complete the number of their days of their life. And their lives shall increase in shalom, and the years of their joy shall be multiplied in eternal gladness and shalom all the days of their life. This is also mentioned in Yob Elim chapter 1, which we'll get to after we get to Moshe on the mountain. And it's mentioned at the death of Abraham, how the calamities and the things will come upon the children for disobedience to the point of children aging and showing signs of being old when they're just newly born and young, which is a phenomenon that literally happens today or has happened. And the fact that once they repent, once we start turning to these things and doing his will, our lives will increase. And you can see both, even in the history of America, for example, you had the, um, in the Wild West times, most people had difficulty living past 40, but you had some from the Civil War era and uh, the others that were pious people from the Reformation or from the Reformed Awakenings the great awakenings that happened that lived well past their 90s or some even into their hundreds. Uh, you can find in the testaments of the 12 patriarchs that <clears throat> those that deserved it had no suffering, were strong, and they, were, they knew when they were going to die, but they died in health and they were content and, in, and happy. And then you had others who were suffering afflictions and had disease or were suffering in their at their death and all these things are according to how we live our life and what we choose to do that's why it's mentioned in the book of Sirach that you never judge a man prosperous until you see the day of his death because he he can make you suffer or he can show you shalom when you pass away Okay, chapter 6. And it says, And it came to be, when the children of men had multiplied, that in those days there were born unto them good-looking and lovely daughters. And the messengers, the sons of Shemaim, saw and lusted after them, and said to one another, Come, let us choose wives, or let us let us choose us wives from among the daughters of men and bring forth children. And Shem Yatza, who was their leader, said to them, I fear that you will not indeed agree to do this deed. Excuse me. And I alone shall have to pay the penalty of a great sin. And they all answered him and said, Let us all swear an oath and all bind ourselves by mutual curses, not to abandon this plan, but to do the matter. Then they all swore together, and bound themselves by mutual curses upon it. And they were, in all, two hundred who descended in the days of Yarad on the summit of Mount Hermon. And Yarad or Jared, as they call it in English, but Yarad means he will come down. And they they came down on the summit of Mount Hermon, and they called the Mount Hermon, because they had sworn and bound themselves by mutual curses upon it. And these are the names of their leaders, Shemlatzatz, which is Shem Yatza, right, their leader, Arak Leba, Ramiel, Kokavel, Tamliel, Ramliel, or this is Rama El, sorry, this is Ramliel, Daniel, Yechezkel, Barakiel, Ashael, Amaros, Betarel, Anan El, Zaklil, Zaklil El, sorry, 
Shem Shafael, Satar El, Zuriel, Yom Yael, and Sariel. These are their chiefs of tens. Chapter 7. And all the others together with them took unto themselves wives, and each one, sorry, and each chose one for himself. And they began to go in unto them and to defile themselves with them. And they taught them charms and enchantments and the cutting of roots and made them to no plants. And they became pregnant, and they brought forth great giants whose heights were 3,000 L's. Now, we had, the other version had mentioned 300 cubits, but the original one here, it said 3,000 L's. And when you look up what an L is, it, it's where we get the word for elbow. But an L is like a cubit, and it's literally from the tip of your fingers to your elbow measurement It on some people. They have different measurements for different people groups. The Scottish had it between, I believe it was 37 inches or so. And the shortest was about 18. So if you do the math for that, you have just a little over a mile to almost two miles tall for what it could have been for these giants and if anyone's looked into the there's a youtube channel called mud fossil university he's not the only one but he's actually done dna testing on uh, a giant hand that's three feet across in the palm uh, i think he has the knuckle a finger bone that's like a giant rock in his yard, he had them DNA tested and had them come back. He's done quite a few pictures. He talks about stuff, a lot of videos. Some of it is nonsense. I don't really agree with. Like, unfortunately, he looks at these pictures from, from Mars and other things that are revealed from NASA, which is really different places in deserts in the world. And he talks about how they, the body parts are in those too. But if you know that they're faking it and it's all from the land here, it's just more evidence. So I, I can't agree with everything the man promotes or says because he's not a strict scripture believer. But you can look at the work and see for yourselves where there's literal body parts of giants and other things that are easily seen and, and actually DNA tested now. He's not the only one. There's other groups online or other YouTube channels that show those things. But the idea of giants being over a mile tall seems unbelievable until you actually see the evidence of it. But it's still there. Anyways, it says they're giants whose heights were 1.2 to 1.75 miles tall, who consumed all the acquisitions of men. This probably helped in making them the way they were. It could be an explanation for why there was giants after the flood as well, because they're all involved with magic, if you recall. But there's nothing specific in the scriptures that's, that say that. That this was a direct cause of the enchantments they were doing. I don't know for certain. But it says, who consumed all the acquisitions of men, and when men could no longer sustain them, the giants turned against them and devoured mankind. And they began to sin against birds and beasts and reptiles and fish and to devour one another's flesh. And they drank blood. Now, again, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, there are some fragments of a writing called the Book of the Giants, which was also known in antiquity in different languages, but there was also in fragments. And in there, you have more detail about the watchers, how they changed shape into different animals, 200 of each kind, and mated with them to create monsters as well as the giants. And this is what it means when it, they sinned against... It's like trolls. I'm sorry? 
or where trolls came from. The idea of trolls. Quite possibly. And some of the trolls, if you look at it, it's, it's rock like giants. Yeah, there I was just looking at a video this lady was putting out about North Norse mythology and some other things like that. Irish uh, myths and things of that nature with trolls and how they became like mountains. Same thing with Indians, too. But you have there's islands where there's a giant dolphin that was an island a giant horse that you can still see a giant elephant, a giant eagle at the top of a rock that's turned into stone. So um, the, the there's a dragon in the north of Africa that's a mountain range now. That's what these things are talking about as well. This is and then the land laid accusation against the lawless ones. Chapter eight. And Azazel taught men to make swords and knives and shields and breastplates and made known to them the metals of the earth and the art of working them. This is why Tubal Cain, he was not the inventor of it, but he was teaching people it. Okay. And bracelets and ornaments and the use of antonomy and the adorning of the eyelids and all kinds of precious stones and all coloring tinctures and alchemy. Now, when our Mishiach comes again, he's going to have us put our, our swords into plow shields, right? The metals are going to melt like wax before his presence when he comes. These things are spoken because of what we've used them for as taught by the watchers here. As Azel in particular, this is why all sins attributed to him. But if you pay careful attention to the things that they introduced to the men and what became of them, ornaments and bracelets to entice men and women to lust after each other, right? The adorning of the eyelids, using makeup, changing what our creator called good. All right. Using precious stones and, and different things for inequality. That's why all these things were counteracted with his instructions, if you recall. And there arose much wickedness, and they committed whoring, and they were led astray, and became corrupt in all their ways. Shem Yatza taught enchantments and root cuttings. Armoros the resolving of enchantments. So the enchantments like what you can see in the Testament of Yahusuf, where the uh, Pontifar's wife tries to use an enchantment in a, a food that he she tries to get to a love potion in it to get him to be enticed after her. Right? Root cuttings. We'll go into that more later. But Amaros, the resolving of enchantment, so the counteracting of these things as a pretext for other than belief. The true belief, if you can recall, or if you've read the Testament of Yahusuf, he was a believer walking piously and magic had no effect on him. Just like all believers after a Mishiach came, demons and their witchcraft had no power on them. Even after these times into modern times, a Bible-believing people that were praying could thwart witchcraft covens and cast the casting of spells. It was something that was witnessed by John Todd, if anyone's familiar with him. If not, I, I encourage you to look him up. He, he, he was in the Illuminati. He was a generational witchcraft, and he came out of that to become a believer, and he exposed a lot of the stuff they were doing, but... There was a witchcraft coven or multiple covens that were trying to cast a spell. And there is just a group of people praying that thwarted that. And the witches acknowledged that they they couldn't have their stuff work because of those Christians praying. That was before he had made known his name or we had the full truth that we have now. But he doesn't hold against you what you're incapable of knowing. And the 
Yaakov says that the fervent prayers of a righteous man accomplishes much. So while there is the truth in believers that these things have no power over them, Satan, especially at the end of the ages, makes a mockery of these things. That's why you have exorcisms in Catholicism. That's why you have exorcisms in witchcraft. And if you listen to John Todd, he says the only difference between those two is about six words. But Barakiel taught astrology, which is refuted quite nicely in the recognitions of Clement by Clement, and it's also repudiated and spoken against by Martin Luther when he was alive. Kokovel, the constellations. Yechezkel, the knowledge of the clouds. Arachiel, the signs of the land. Shamshiel, the signs of the sun. And Sariel, the course of the moon. And it also says in another version, and the deceptions of men. Now, if you're not familiar, all of these things are used like um, people will look at the different ways clouds are shaped and come up with ideas uh, of foretelling or prognostication. People will look at the signs in the land or things that animals or birds do and come up with prognostications. Same thing with the sun and the moon and different things like that. It's still done today. It was taught by the watchers and it's it's different forms of witchcraft, which we're not supposed to have anything to do with. And as men perished, they cried and their cry went up to the Shemaim. Chapter 9. And then Mikael, Oriel, Raphael, and Gabarel, or Gabriel, which if you're not familiar, this is Mikael is who is like El, Oriel is the light of El, Raphael is the healer, or my El is my healer, right? And Gabriel is the mighty man of El looked down from the Shemaim and saw much blood being shed upon the land and all lawlessness being wrought upon the land. And they said to one another, The land made without inhabitant cries the voice of their crying up to the gates of the Shemaim. And now to you, the Kodeshim, or set-apart ones of Shemaim, the inner beings of men make their petition, saying, Bring our cause before the Most High. Now, just like Hanok, or I'm sorry, just like Havel or Abel, after he was murdered by his brother, his blood cried out, Scripture says. A lot of people don't get the connection here, but the Scriptures quite common in the English translation, it says the life is in the blood. The life is in the blood. You don't eat flesh with the blood because the life is in the blood. But if you look at the Hebrew word there, it's not the word for life, which is chai or chayim, where we get our word hi in English, saying hi to someone is saying life to them. But it's the word for nefesh, which is your immortal inner being or what they call the soul that is in the blood it permeates throughout the whole body because that's where your soul is you can see a full picture of that very well in the letter of diogentes which is a renewed covenant writing where a gentleman he is writing to diogentes who was the instructor of marcus aurelius i believe but it was he's trying to convert him to the belief, and he mentions how the Nazarim are like the soul in the earth to the soul in the body, and he does the comparison between them. But back to the point, our nefesh is in our, the blood, and when the blood spilled out, it was the blood or the nefesh, the immortal inner being of men that were crying out here, because while the body dies, the inner being does not. 
quite still alive and aware and crying out for right ruling to be done. That's a refutation right here for anyone that thinks that you just sleep or you cease to exist when you die, which is actually a heretical. Uh, it's a, an agnostic opinion that was brought by Simon the Magician to Kepha in the recognitions of Clement when they're disputing with one another. And they said to Yahuwah of the ages, Master of masters, Elohim of Elohim, King of kings, and Yahuwah of the ages, the throne of your esteem is unto all the generations of the ages. Your name is Kodesh, or set apart, and magnificent, and Baruch, unto all the ages. You have made all, and with you, sorry, and you have power over all. And all are naked and open in your sight, and you see all matters, and none can hide himself from you. You see what Azazel has done, who taught all unrighteousness upon the land, and revealed the eternal secrets which are in the Shemaim, which men were striving to learn. And Shem Yatza, to whom you have given authority to rule over his associates, and they have gone to the daughters of men upon the land, and have slept with the women, and have defiled themselves and revealed to them all kinds of sins. And the women have borne giants, and by this the whole land has been filled with blood and unrighteousness. And now, see, the inner beings of those who have died are crying out and making their petition to the gates of the Shamayim. And their lamentations have ascended and cannot cease because of the lawless deeds which are wrought on the land. And you know all matters before they come to pass. And you see these, and you allow them. And you do not say to us what we are to do to them in regard to these. Now, if you pay careful attention, I'll try to point it out as much as I can. But... Our Creator is true and consistent and unchanging in His ways. So as you do, it will be done unto you. You reap what you sow, and the things that that you do to another will happen at, to you. Everything they did as an affront to Him and to men is what they suffered themselves. And you'll see that with how He acts. It sounds very harsh. The judgment against them is extreme. But if you think about it, and if you take the time to consider what it was they did, then it's only them doing ex getting exactly what they did to another done to them, which is still a horrible thing. But here we go. This is chapter 10. <clears throat> it says, Then said the Most High, the Kadosh and Great One spoke, and sent Oriel to the son of Lemek, and said to him, Go to Noach and tell him in my name, hide yourself and reveal to him the end of that which is approaching. For the whole land will be destroyed and the flood is about to come upon the whole land and will destroy all that is on it. And now instruct him that he may escape, and his seed may be preserved for all the generations of the world. And again Yahuwah said to Raphael, Bind Azazel hand and foot, and cast him into the darkness, and make an opening in the desert which is in Dudael, and cast him in there and place upon him rough and jagged rocks, 
and cover him with darkness, and let him abide there forever, and cover his face that he may not see the light. And on the day of the great judgment he shall be cast into the fire. Again, think of the things that he introduced into the lives of men. All right, rough and jagged rocks covered in darkness. These are the things that we suffer when we afflict each other, weapons of war, and things that cause inequality and other evils that stem from them. And on the day of the great judgment, he shall already he shall be cast into the fire. <clears throat> and heal the land which the messengers have corrupted, and proclaim the healing of the land, that they may heal the plague, and that all the children of men may not perish through all the secrets that the watchers have disclosed and have taught their sons. And the whole land has been corrupted through the works that were taught by Azazel. To him ascribe all sin. And again, it's because of this right here that we have the illusion of it or the foretelling of this that's accomplished every year originally at the Day of Atonement. When, if you read about the instructions for it, the Kohen would have two goats. One would be the goat of Yahuwah, which would be offered as his offering. And the other would be the Azazel goat, which all the people would put their sins on it. And it would be sent off into the wilderness. And Yahuwah said to Gabriel, <clears throat> proceed against the half-breeds, the other translation says bastards, but it's the illegitimate children, okay? Proceed against the half-breeds and the reprobates and against the children of whoring or adultery and destroy the children of the watchers from amongst men. Send them against one another that they may be destroyed or that they may destroy each other in battle for they shall not have length of days. And no request that they make of you shall be granted unto their fathers on their behalf. For they hope to live an eternal life, and that each one of them will live five hundred years. So it doesn't go into detail here, but the watchers were making petitions and, and asking for things that we'll, we'll read about in a little bit. But the things that they were asking for were not going to be granted because when men were begging them and asking petition, they were ignored. And they gave no request without mercy, so they received none. And Yahuwah said to Mikael, <clears throat> Go Bind Shemyatza and his associates who have united themselves with women so as to have defiled themselves with them in all their uncleanness. And when their sons have slain one another, and when they have seen the destruction of their beloved ones, bind them fast for seventy generations under the land, till the day of their judgment and of their complete end till the judgment that is forever and ever is concluded. In those days they shall be led off to the abyss of the fire, and to the torment and the prison in which they shall be confined forever. Now, before we move on real quick, this mentions 70 generations. A lot of people make a lot of different opinions about that. A generation doesn't last a thousand years anymore. All right. And 70 would have been 70,000 years. There, there's a lot of different ideas that come about with this, but you have to remember we're reading a book that has carried down through history for thousands of years. And it's an abridged version at best of what was originally there. So sometimes you're going to find things that don't quite make sense or line up. Right. Excuse me. 
Another example is in the explanation of how the moon functions later on, where you don't really get the whole gist of it until you find the Dead Sea Scrolls. In there, they have many more scrolls that talk about the luminaries and the calendar and how it's supposed to function. And the, the moon goes through a three-year cycle before it repeats itself. It's one of the signs that you're on track with the calendars when there's a full moon on the first night of the year every third year. But we don't see that in Hanok. You see a little bit of a little bit of it talked about, and then some error in the same way here. You find something where it mentions 70 generations, but you don't have context for anything else there. However, it mentions they're going to be there until the complete end, until the day of the great throne judgment where they're brought up, judged, and tossed into the lake of fire. And you have a second witness of that very thing in the animal apocalypse later on. So that's where you have to use right judgment. And you have to look at what you have multiple witnesses for and hold fast to the things that you can prove. With this, this is an ambiguous statement that could mean any number of things. So you can't take that and be dogmatic when you only have one witness with the fact that they're going to be imprisoned until the, their judgment and then tossed into the lake of fire, you have two or more witnesses. So those are the things that you should hold to as true and not to the things that you cannot support with multiple witnesses. That, that's the whole point. And that's the whole point of studying to show yourself approved. It's not just in this instance, but every time you have something come up like that, including every opinion just like you find with the 120 years mentioned at the flood people make a lot of different doctrines about that but in reality it was given in the 480th year of noah's life and then when he was 600 the flood happened and that goes on with what it was saying here that they wanted to live 500 years and have eternal life as an expectation but it was not going to be granted to them they got to live for 120 and the children are literally demons in the land until the the condemnation or the consummation of all things in which they will be consigned to eternal fire and undying worms forever. It says, and whoever shall be condemned and destroyed will from thereon be bound together with them to the end of all generations, meaning those that join with them or do what is displeasing in our Creator's sight will join them in the lake of fire. And destroy all the inner beings of the reprobate and the children of the watchers because they have wronged mankind. And destroy all the wicked from the face of the land and let every evil work come to an end, and let the plant of righteousness and truth appear forever. And it shall prove a baraka. The works of righteousness and truth shall be planted in truth and joy forever. This plant of righteousness is mentioned in Yobelim. It, it's mentioned by our Mashiach, where he is the vine and we are the branches. It's mentioned in the Odes of Shalomo, or Odes of Solomon, as it's called. It talks about how the planting is the work of Yahuwah, and he's the gardener. Again, allusions that our Mashiach makes himself. So you can read about those to find more about this, but this is the first mention of it here. <clears throat> and then shall all the righteous escape and shall live till they bring forth thousands of children, and all the days of their youth and their old age they shall complete in shalom. And then the whole land shall be tilled in righteousness, and shall be or and shall all be planted with trees and be full of baraka. And all desirable trees shall be planted on it, and they shall plant vines on it, and the vine which they plant upon it shall yield wine in abundance. And as for all the seed which is sown on, upon it, each measure shall bear a thousand, and each measure of olives shall yield ten presses of oil. And 
this is also alluded to in second Baruch, I believe, talking about the uh, the beginnings of the millennial reign and the forever after. It's also mentioned, I believe, in by Josephus. It might be in the Psalms as well, but I can't recall distinctly at the moment. And I know the foretellers talk about these times, but it's alluded to minutely. These things aren't clearly spoken about in too many places. And you cleanse the land from all oppression and from all unrighteousness and from all sin. And, sorry, I have that written twice. And from all inequity and from all uncleanness that is wrought upon the land, destroy from off the land. And all the children of men shall become righteous, and all nations shall offer adoration, and shall praise me, and all shall worship me. And the land shall be cleansed from all defilement, and from all sin, and from all punishment, and from all torment. And I will never again send upon or send them right upon it from generation to generation and forever. I was just reminded someone had asked me a question the other day about <clears throat> there's a part in the foretellers where it talks about the Ark of the Covenant will not be remembered anymore and it won't even come to mind. And she was wondering how that was even possible. And then I had reminded her, well, I did it in the form of asking a question, but I had reminded her that there's going to come a time where there's no more sin or corruption or the remembrance of anything that causes grief or sadness. And if you keep in mind, what was the reason for the ark? The original tablets were carried down by Moshe. And when he saw the golden calf incident, the children, both houses sinning and breaking the covenant they had just sworn three times to uphold, he threw them down and broke them. And then they had to be remade, but they were hidden and no man could look upon them. They were hidden within the ark and kept, kept safe from that kind of thing again. So the ark was a testament to the man's failure to keep the truth the first time. And because of it, the added bonds from due to transgression were added to the Torah. That's what our Mashiach came to put away in 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 his dying for us and ratifying the covenant and bringing the renewed covenant or the new covenant, if you will. It's where the added bonds are no longer applicable to man. And there's going to come a time when there is no more sin or death or sorrow, no more tears and no remembrance of these evil things. That includes the remembrance of why there was an ark to begin with. Chapter 11 says, And in those days I shall open the storerooms of Baraka, or blessing, which are in the Shemaim, so as to send them down upon the land over the work and labor of the children of men. And Shalom and Truth shall become partners together in all the days of the world and in all the generations of the world. This is also alluded to in the Dead Sea Scrolls from the Damascus document. The beginning of it is called the Exhortation. I believe it's in there. But there's the part where it talks about the two Ruachoth that rule over man. It says the truth and inequity are bound together right now, but it's going to come a time where the truth will reign supreme and the evil Ruach or the evil spirit will be removed from the world. And that's when truth will reign with Shalom. Also, later on in this book, when Hanok is shown how the winds work and the different winds that come from the different cardinal directions, they uh, bring both Baraka and curse, depending on that. If you look at what the, um, the Ruach is wind or the Ruach is the wind, but the word for pestilence is the same as the word for the word. Dabir, Dabar, is a word, matter, or thing, but it's also the word that's used for plague or the pestilence that's brought on men for disobedience. In particular, 
You can see it when Dawid numbers the children after they entice or after they upset our creator from what they're doing. And because of that, he says that there's three things that can happen. Either you're going to run from your enemies for a while and be overcome. You're going to have uh, a famine in the land or you're going to have pestilence. And Dawid says that let him and let all of them fall into the hand of Yahuwah and not into the hand of man. So he sends pestilence among them. Chapter 12. <clears throat> Before these matters, Hanok was hidden, and none of the children of men knew where he was hidden and where he abode and what had become of him. Now, it doesn't go into too much detail, but from his 365th year until like 500 years old he was with them he was walking with the messengers learning all these things he went back he showed these things to his sons gave them the books and preached to him for a year and then he was taken to paradise the, i believe that's the the proper chronological order of events there but after he was 365 they didn't know where he was he would he disappeared and his abode was with the watchers as you see and his activities had to do with the watchers, and his days were with the Kodeshim. And I, Hanok, Barak Yahuwah of majesty and the king of the ages. And see, the watchers called me, Hanok the scribe, and said to me, Hanok, you scribe of righteousness, go and declare to the watchers of the Shemaim, who have left the high Shemaim, the Kadosh eternal place, and have defiled themselves with women, and have done as the children of the land do, and have taken unto themselves wives. You have wrought great destruction on the land. Now, it's the children of the land that, that are our creators as opposed to the children of Shemaim which are the watchers, okay? <clears throat> and you shall have no shalom, nor the forgiveness of sin. And inasmuch as they delight themselves in their children, the murder of their beloved ones shall they see, and over the destruction of their children shall they lament, and shall make supplication unto eternity, but compassion and shalom shall you not obtain. And again, that's a harsh sentence, but they're reaping what they sowed. Chapter 13. And Hanok went and said, Azazel, you have no shalom. A severe sentence has gone forth against you to put you in bonds. And you shall not have toleration nor request granted to you because of the unrighteousness which you have taught and because of all the works of wickedness and unrighteousness and sin which you have shown men. Then I went and spoke to them all together, and they were all afraid, and fear and trembling seized them. And they pleaded with me to draw up a petition for them, that they might find forgiveness, and to read their petition in the presence of Yahuwah of the Shemaim. For from henceforth they could not speak, nor raise their eyes unto Shemaim, for the shame of their sins for which they had been condemned. Then I wrote out their petition and the prayer in regard to their spirits and their deeds of each one of them, and in regard to their request that they should have forgiveness of sin and length of days. And I went off and sat down at the waters of Dan in the land of Dan, 
to the southwest of Hermon. I read their petition till I fell asleep. And see, a dream came to me, and visions fell down upon me, and I saw visions of rebuke, and a voice came bidding to tell it to the sons of Shamayim and reprimand them. And when I awoke, I came unto them, and they were all sitting gathered together, weeping in Avatseel, which is between Lebanon and Senesir, with their faces covered. And I recounted before them all the visions which I had seen in sleep, and began to speak words of righteousness and to reprimand the watchers of the Shemaim. So, again, when they were exalted and brought low, he was low and, and made exalted, and that's another sign of the, the first shall be last and the last shall be first kind of thing, where he looks at the humble and lifts them up out of the dunghill. But we're going to be getting to that next week. We have to edit this more as we go uh, the the um the version of the pdf that we'd had was not it was tampered with or it was edited again and it's not very good anymore so i'm sorry for that but i'm willing you can see the difference between this one and the one that we read last week and you can judge for yourselves however that, that's all we have for today and we will continue with the same stuff going in chapter 14 next week so you all have a wonderful shabbat and we will talk to you then